Good evening and hello and welcome to East Side Lutherans Together in Faith. I am Pastor Lane Nelson and I am here tonight with... Hey, I'm Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel Pakin and the two of us are here to enter into you as we do each week into these conversations of faith where we look at a topic or we look at a book of scripture and we think about what does that mean for our faith and and how do we continue to grow in our walk of faith as we go through the years because as we know life is filled with with spiritual scriptural moments and and this book of faith that we call the bible is a living breathing part of our daily lives Tonight we're going to do something a little bit different, but if you are out there and if you are um, participating in this conversation, please jump in, say hello in the chat, but we're not going to be doing as much conversation back and forth tonight because we will be doing, bump, bump, bum, mm-hmm. Together in Faith, welcome to Lutheranism 101 and 102, 201. <laughs> and so we will be talking a little bit about what does it mean for us to be Lutheran Christians. What is a Lutheran? Where did they come from? And what exactly do they do today? So that's kind of our conversation that we're about to have. So as we get ready to jump into this conversation with one another, I'm going to throw up a little bit of information on the screen that kind of helps us enter into that. But first, a little teaser. I'm going to flash this link on the screen. If you are willing to bear with us and stick through this whole conversation tonight, we will do a little fun video at the end um, about some people who you might not know who are Lutherans. But more on that in just a little bit. So bear with us and we will get there. But, okay, Lutheranism. What do I need to know about Lutheranism in order to understand how they view the world and why they do what they do? they do. So that's kind of the perspective we'll be taking as we're looking at this tonight. Now, we have um, another quote that Pastor Joel used in his sermon on um, Sunday, which really is descriptive. And so I'm going to put that on the screen for you to see, and I will invite him to share that. To share that quote? Yeah. Uh, So this uh, comes from Freedom of a Christian, which was Martin Luther's big hit you know, bestseller, Wittenberg Times. Uh, the New York Times was nothing at the t- at, in 1520. But, uh, the Wittenberg Hot 100. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was. It was huge. It got translated into Latin, German, and what um, they considered low German. So it was a, a multi-language hit. Uh, and, and probably the most famous quote out of that was something that I used in my sermon this last Sunday, and it is, the Christian is a completely free lord of all, subject to none, and the Christian is completely dutiful servant of all, subject to all. And um, for me, this is just like a great Lutheranism 101 quote. It's very much, if you will, that kind of Lutheran perspective of um, already, not yet, both and at the same time, but, but more on that a little bit later. Okay, So exactly who are the Lutherans and where are they at? Um, Oh, wrong slide. Here we go. (laughs) Who are we today, Lutherans in the world? Did you know there are 80 million Lutherans in the world and they exist on all continents? Probably not living much in Antarctica, but you know, I bet some have gone there. (laughs) So, but other than that, there are Lutherans living on every continent all around the world. And I am going to invite Pastor Joel to talk a little bit more about that. He has um, some information on his computer sure. I'm going to pop up for you to see. So this was a, uh, a, a slide, um, or a, and actually a pop quiz that I did with the 8th grade confirmation class a couple weeks huh. ago. And so I asked them to guess what were the 10 largest, uh, what was the order of the 10 largest Lutheran churches in the world? And so these are the 10 largest Lutheran churches. And I'm going to pull up this map here. And you'll see on this map, this shows kind of faith traditions, the shades of blue, Christianity, Islam is uh, shades of green, uh, Buddhism, you see Hinduism. And so the top 10 Lutheran churches, I'm just going to um, pull them up here. Did you, would you have guessed that the 10th largest Lutheran denomination 
is in Madagascar. That's the Malagasy Lutheran Church. There's not that much space in Madagascar. There are three million Lutherans on that island. Huh. <laughs> and would you have guessed that the ninth largest Lutheran denomination is in a majority Hindu country of India? That's the Andhra Evangelical Lutheran Church, also three million. And here we come in the U.S. We are the eighth largest Lutheran denomination. Eight? In... You would think we would be more. No, no, not not. But it's great. You know, we have we have over, uh, you know slightly over three million uh, Evangelical Lutherans uh, in America. The ELCA. Uh, seventh is the Church of Norway. Yay, Ufta. <laughs> and uh, sixth is. The Church of Finland, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland. Five, we're going to stay up in your Church of Denmark. A little pattern here. That's right. But then the fourth largest Lutheran denomination is the Protestant Church, Protestant Christian Batak Church, and it's in a majority Muslim country. What? Yeah, I know, right? So interesting. The third largest Lutheran Church is the Church of Sweden, and then... This, I'm <clears throat> guessing you wouldn't have guessed this, everybody. There, I think, were maybe, maybe there was one or two eighth graders who were kind of around here that got this right. But the second largest Lutheran church is the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Tanzania with 6.5 million Lutherans. That's practically twice as many as in the United States. That's right, yeah. And largest Evangelical Lutheran church is the Ethiopian Evangelical Church. And, and they have 8.3 million members. Parts of these are all denominations that are that are parts of the Lutheran World Federation. So it was just a really fun and interesting quiz to kind of share with our eighth grade confirmation class. And I'm glad I get to share it with you yeah. today. Flash that back up again. It's interesting. We are the only larger body on the whole western side of the hemisphere. Everything else is on the eastern side of the hemisphere. That yeah, other across the pond, across right? Across the pond, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's wow. really, really interesting. Well, that just is mind-boggling yeah. to me, you know. Yeah. We get so we get so um, caught up in who we are and we think that, you know, the Lutherans in America are the only Lutherans in the world. But, I mean, Lutheranism didn't start in America, so it yeah. makes sense that it would be yeah. in other places in the world. Well, we are here at Eastside Lutheran Church. We are located on 10th Street with a new sign <laughs> um, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our little pocket of Lutherans, this congregation, was formed in the year 1919. So we're coming up now. 102 years old, yeah. um, being together as Lutherans in this space, started by two other Lutheran churches who were in the city who wanted to have another Lutheran church on the east side or on the other side of the uh, tracks. Other side of the tracks, you might man. say. So we're kind of the other side of the tracks Lutheran, or at least 102 years ago. Now we're center city. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of who. We are, but a little broader context, Eastside Lutheran is a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or we say the ELCA. The ELCA is a church body that was formed in 1988 by three other denominations coming together so that they could be a larger body, do more, um, and just have some, some union in faith. And they were the ALC, or the American Lutheran Church, the AELC, or the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches in America, and the LCA, Lutheran Church in America. We have these three different bodies coming together. And depending on the church that you are at in this country, you hold a little bit of the DNA, I think, left over from those sure. church bodies, even though we are a new entity, a new family, and have been um, since 88. So yeah. quite some time now. Um, a little bit on the ELCA real quick. We are comprised of 3.3 million baptized members or Number eight, mm -hmm. we are 8,900 congregations, and this is data new um, as of December of 2020. Yeah. Our churchwide organization is based out of Chicago, Illinois, where there is an ELCA churchwide bishop and various staff. Geographically, we are split up across um, the United States and the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean across 65 synods. Mm -hmm. We have seven seminaries, that's pastor schools, <laughs> and 27 ELCA colleges. And then all of these other entities, over 2,000 schools, early childhood education centers, campus ministries, outdoor ministries, social service agencies, 
and various things across the country and throughout the world. We exist in other places around the world as well. So the big question comes up then, what do we believe as ELCA Mm -hmm. Lutherans? Again, a quick overview without going into depth, but, but I think this is important for us to understand as we dig in because it informs what you hear in sermons. It informs how we act outside of church. We are Christ people or mm-hmm. Christians, yes. and we are Trinitarian. That is, we yep. believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We can't always explain it real well, but that's what we believe. <laughs> well, and, 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 and I think that was, uh, that's probably true uh, for um, the Trinity just in general. If, right. If somebody thinks you've got it pinned down, well. Yeah. Mm, but, I mean, and, and part of that is the is our creedal nature, right? That true. We, that we kind of, is that next on your slide there? Getting there, that, getting there, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I, I jumped it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We are a biblical church. That is, we believe that the Holy Scriptures are the source and norm for daily life, the way that we live together. Um, We are confessional, as Pastor Joel was alluding to. That is, we have three creeds that we profess. We believe in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, though that's not my favorite, just my (laughs) personal piece. Um, And then all of the contents that we have in this little red book called the Book of Concord... At least my version is right. I'll see. I'll see oh. yours. You got the Tappert it's thicker version. Thicker and blue. Look at that. And this yeah. is the Cold Winger. So wow. the Tappert one was uh, a translate English translation that was done by Tappert in, sure. at the seminary in Philadelphia, where I went to school. Yep. And then this is uh, a more recent translation that was a combination of Robert Kolb, who was I took a class in my undergrad yeah. in St. Paul, Minnesota, on Jesus. Ah, and, well, and, good. Glad you did that. Yeah, and yeah. and Robert Cole was the uh, was the teacher for that, and then Wingert, who was a, a Lutheran uh, historian at the seminary in Philadelphia. There you so, go, Philadelphia, Philadelphia. But not to one up you, but this particular copy was given to me by Dick Adkins, who I believe is out there tonight oh. for t- watching in this. So ah. one of our members here. Thank you for this. Your book's getting used. This was a, a, a gift to me from Rich Carter, one of my uh, theologi- theological professors in undergrad. All right, uh, all back right. to the topic at hand. <laughs> we are also Christocentric, which is a big fancy word, meaning as Lutherans, even though we believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we focus a lot on Jesus and, and who Jesus yeah. is, as do many Christians, but Lutherans in particular. Yeah. So what do all of these things mean? Well, we are saved by grace through faith. We hear that a lot. Mm-hmm. It means we cannot do anything to save ourselves, but that God in Christ has already done it for us, and that we are saved not just for the, for the heck of it, but God has a reason for saving us, if you will. So if you open up your Bibles where you are at to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, one of my favorite passages, and so I'm going to read that to you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So I think that's important to to remember that second part of this famous passage, that we are saved by grace, that what God has done for us, and being then saved and freed, we are then to do good works or to do things for other people. And that ties into that that, that Luther uh you know, quote about yeah. um, uh, Lord of all, subject to none, because we are saved by grace, yep. not of our own works. But we are also servant to all, subject to all, because there we are to do good works in response, in joyful response to uh, the free grace that we have been given. You got it. Yeah, yeah. Now, all of this comes down also to the way we act. As Lutherans, we have two sacraments, Holy Baptism, Holy Communion. Um, Roman Catholic brothers and sisters of ours have seven, but Luther defines sacrament as something instituted by Jesus for the forgiveness of sins that then also includes an earthly element. So we have Holy Baptism and Holy Communion. And then right off of our ELCA's webpage, as members of the ELCA, we believe that we are freed in Christ to serve and love our neighbor. With our hands, we do God's work of restoring and reconciling communities in Jesus Christ's name 
throughout the world, and we trace our roots back throughout the mid-17th century when early Lutherans came to America and Europe, settling in the Virgin Islands and in the area that is known as New York. Even before that, Martin Luther sought to reform the church in the 16th century, laying the framework for our beliefs. And so that is who we are and a little bit about our roots. So the question is, where does this name Lutheran come from? Oh, he's wearing... Yes, (laughs) the hat came out. It comes from this person, Martin Luther, who lived a long, long time ago and was caught up in in what was going on in the world. Um, And and that just sparked a whole movement, both religious and political. But again, I'm getting just a wee bit ahead of myself, and this is a little off-center. So we'll maybe set that aside for now. But um, back to this conversation... (laughs) All craziness aside, Martin Luther, who lived in the late 1400s, born in the 1480s, and and Mm -hmm. lived throughout almost to 1550, I think he died in 49, 1549, 48, he was a German, he was um, a Roman Catholic, as every Christian was at that time. Um, he was a, well. Uh, the, well, I suppose the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox folks that's were true. already splitting off. My bad. Yep. Right, yep. Right. We had a so, whole other wing. Yep, yes, but, but many. Yep. Right. Um, monk, a priest, a professor, and a reformer, and a large part of the Protestant Reformation, and a very influential person in world history, um, even for non-religious people. His work that he did sparked so many changes, not only in Europe, but then. Um, the rest of the world. So, a little bit on Martin Luther's story, um, a little bit about who he was. There is a, a wonderful story of, of Martin Luther and how he decided to, to go and enter um, the monastery. And I'm going to ask Pastor Joel to share just a snippet of that, if he would. Sure. Well, so, so, uh, so many big changes happening in um, Europe, in Germany at that time. Uh, his, his, dad is a miner and um there's this all of a sudden kind of building up of the middle class in germany and it allows martin luther because if you go to school you have to pay for it uh there's no such thing as public education and so martin luther gets to go to school that's the first thing that changes uh martin luther's dad um wants him to become educated and he martin luther's dad really wants him to become a lawyer because that's where the money is. That's right. That's where the prestige is. Yeah. And so his 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 mining father. That's where mom and dad's <laughs> retirement is. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Very much so. Right. And so the the cultures are shifting uh, very uh, quickly. And so um, yeah. Sorry. I'm over here. <laughs> so so the cultures are shifting, and Martin Luther is going to college, and he's he's. Uh, trapped in a storm and there's this major lightning storm and he is fearful for his life and he prays he says if i survive this storm i will become a monk he's bargaining with god and he survives and he immediately goes to um to the monastery it happens to be in augustinian monastery in the town of erfurt and he knocks on the door and he's here he said, I'm, I've pledged myself to being a monk. And his dad is not happy because now he is, he's not going to get married. He's not going to be a lawyer. He's not going to do all those things sure, that his right. dad sent him to school for. Um, but that is the beginning of that faith <clears throat> journey. But he's already got this kind of foundation in um, the kind of Renaissance education. Yep. Uh, he's already got this kind of basis in language and and rhetoric and these things that, that come out in as he becomes a very prolific writer and controversial. You might figure. say the Holy Spirit was sowing some seeds and providing some tools that would be yeah. used later in life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, to to kind of jump ahead a, a little bit as as Luther then is um, in school and. Um, 
or being a monk, he has his own demons that he wrestles with, and he sure. just cannot get over the fact that he's a sinner. And every time he he confesses his sins and kind of gets that clean slate, if you will, he does something or has a thought or something that he believes just stains him. And, and this idea of of not being able to to get clean, to be forgiven, um, just torments him. And he has this idea of God, who is just this judge over the top of him, always condemning him. Well. He becomes a monk, becomes a priest, and then his mentors who see him wrestling with all of these things say, all right, we'll see if we can address this. And so they send him to Wittenberg to be a professor of Bible. And believe it or not, you could be a monk and even a priest in the 1500s and not know nothing about Bible. Right. Because there just weren't that many of them, and most of the world wasn't reading them. Most of the world wasn't literate. And so he is teaching Bible and studying, and as he goes through this, he comes across these passages in Romans that talk about God's gift as a free gift, about how we are saved through what God has done through us through faith. And so this whole idea then of being saved through faith was just mind-blowing. And it causes all kinds of, of things for him to start thinking about and questioning and going, can the church really be wrong? Can me, little old Martin, um, be understanding things correctly and the rest of the world and the church and the Pope all be getting it wrong? And the more he looks at Bible, the more he's convinced that, yeah, that's the way it is. And, and so that had to be a, a fairly earth-shaking kind of experience for a person to go through. And so then the famous story is that he then writes these 95 theses or 95 questions for debate that he wants to have some discussion on so that there can be some reform, reformation, in the church, pounds them on the door of the um, castle church in Wittenberg on the right. night before All Saints Day, or as we call it, Halloween, mm -hmm. <laughs> and to, to start this conversation. And then things just exploded. Yeah. Well, there's context here for the Reformation. Just as seeds might have been sown in Luther's life to have the tools to do the things that he was going to be doing in mm -hmm. Europe, and especially Northern Europe, it was becoming a political hotbed. Because you can envision all of these folks in Northern Europe, where we saw many of those dots on the map come up a right. little bit ago. Um, the people who are telling them what to do are coming from the south end of Europe and particularly out of Rome. And the church weighs a lot of political influence in those days. Mm -hmm. And so who living in Germany wants somebody in Rome, Italy, telling them what to do, what they can do, what right. they can't do, influencing taxes and structures and all of those things. So there is this movement throughout Europe, especially northern Europe, about overthrowing these powers that are beating us down and preventing right. us from doing what we want to do. So it's a hotbed for political reform as well as the religious reforms that Luther is talking about. And so they all come together in kind of this cataclysmic movement um, in history. So at the center then for Luther is this whole concept of indulgences. And like I have on the screen, that's not the indulgence of a little chocolate after supper. Okay. It's something else. Joel, what were indulgences? Uh, indulgences were, um, well, um, uh, you're, you're going to love this, taxes, church taxes. Church taxes. <laughs> it That's was an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. right. It was yeah. basically you, uh, you paid some money and then you could get um, uh, time taken off your sentence in purgatory. What's or, purgatory? Um, purgatory is this um, fanciful made up place that um, scripture maybe alludes to but doesn't really talk about sure that was a theological concept that um when you, you know, when you died you went to purgatory where you could kind of work off some of your misdeeds and so it, you could pay an indulgence and take away time for yourself or your loved ones you mean like grandma yep Mima, Mima. and poppy could uh, you could you could pay some money and 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 get them into heaven sooner uh, was the basic sure. idea yeah right and then also as I understand it there was a little bit of a um, building project going on this is true at, since, since the taxes hence St <laughs> Peter's in Rome and so there was a big push a big capital campaign maybe right, um, right. to raise the money to pay for that beautiful structure and so they sent a person by the name of Tetzel to go around and push indulgences hard to get mm -hmm. money and so there was a hard sell on this and when he got around to where Luther was at he just went 
through the roof at this concept yeah. that you can pay money to receive forgiveness of sins. It was so contrary to what he was learning and teaching um, in Scripture. Yeah. It was just crazy. Mm -hmm. And so that fueled then um, so much debate. And right. But there's something that happens when you go against the powers that be, and especially when you're threatening the dollars that they're trying to raise. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when you tap into somebody's money or tax yeah. structure, mm -hmm. there's bound to be consequences. And so Luther um, was called out on this. And so there was um, all of these conversations and the Pope's telling him to stop and he's saying no. And, and if a little old um, professor, priest, monk in Wittenberg, Germany can get on the radar of yeah. the Pope in Rome, that's a big deal. I mean, right. they weren't you know, posting stuff on social media about this. Right. Word had to travel all the way down to Rome that there's some crazy guy up there threatening all of our um, building project mm -hmm. in our cathedral in our backyard. Right. So... Eventually, Luther finds himself at the Diet of Worms. Yes. Now, that's not something that you eat that is really horrible. <laughs> but it was a convention that was put together in the city of Worms yep. to say, hey, Luther, you got to quit doing this stuff um, or you're right. going to be in big trouble. And Luther, being the stubborn person that he was eventually, said, you know, no, can't do that unless I am convinced um, by what I hear in, in mm -hmm. Scripture and the Holy Spirit, I cannot take back the things I've been saying and writing. Now, you mentioned he was a prolific writer. Oh, yeah. Well, we practically had the Internet then mm -hmm. <laughs> with the way things were going because he would write these things, and the power of the press took over. Yep. So it wasn't just a few people in churches talking about this. Right. Because of the printing press, it was being spread on these little tracks yeah. all over um, Europe. and. Pretty soon, people in their homes started talking about yeah. what was going on and this guy Luther and others because there were other reformers who were very much a part of this conversation of needing to change things that were yeah. contrary to yeah. Scripture. Yeah. But um, at Worms, ultimately, it, it led to the point where the Pope said to stop and Luther said no, and so he got kicked out of the church, and then when he still wouldn't stop, there was a price put on his head. Yeah, yeah, there was. Yeah. Luther was holding to his grounds um, of grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. Here I stand, I can do no other. Mm -hmm. And that that has to be the basis for how we understand God and the world and, and our actions. Um, at the same time, though, he was also very much a believer that we are also same-time saint and same-time sinner. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't get overly pious on this. And that same-time saint and same-time sinner is a, a concept I think most of us can can relate to. Yeah. Forgiven, um, we have the freedom of a Christian, right? Yeah. But we also do things on a daily that we know go contrary to God's desire for our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, so Luther is on lamb, if you will. There's a price on his head. Yeah. And enter the wealthy benefactor, Frederick the Wise of Saxony. And, and a number of kind of dukes and princes who wanted, liked this idea of not sending their money to Rome to yes. build a church way down there in Italy. So it wasn't just that they were theologically agreeing with Luther. Yeah, they, they had some political and financial, financial. <laughs> stake in the game as well. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. these are world relations. It's a little right. UN kind of a conversation yep. going on yep. here. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, what happens when you are on the run? In this instance, um, Luther gets kidnapped on his way home and taken off in hiding only to find that it's this wealthy benefactor who for his own safety yeah. is is taking him away to save his life. And so Luther hides out then for a time at the castle in Witten, or in um, Wartburg. Wartburg Castle. I have a photo up uh, on uh, that same screen if you oh, want to Oh, yes. Up. So um, this is the Wartburg Castle. And uh, Amy and I were there for a couple different musical performances uh, there in various parts of uh, Lutherland around Germany. So, uh, in fact, there's a, a photo of you, Lane, uh, when you were there. May I pull this down? Yeah, let me, I'll just, yeah, go for it. That'd be better. So this is... Uh, Lane and, and Jen there, January little, 2001? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, would have been January of 01. Yeah. And so, the infant in the basket at Jennifer's feet would be our son Jonah, 
who was under two so he could fly for free. That's great, man. Yeah. So so this this castle, so he's 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 taken away to this castle and he's he's instructed he's actually given a fake identity. Oh yes. Yeah, so his name is Junker George. Junker George is his uh his name. Uh and and he is a, a knight of the castle or a Junker, which is like a kind of a porter, I guess. Yeah. Uh and um and you can go up and get this tour and 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 kind of hang out on the grounds of this castle. It's really lovely. It's at this high spot where you can kind of look over all of the countryside and and as you could see in those pictures. But uh, so so uh, he's there under anonymity. Uh huh. And um has to figure out to do something, and so he translates the Bible, the New Testament, into the German language and starts to codify. The German, because the German language had all these different dialects, but because Luther is taking this this sacred text and then putting it into the language of the people, he's kind of actually unifying all these different dialects of German. Which then not only brought about insight into scripture that people now had access to in their own language that they wouldn't have before, because it would have been written in Latin, and, and most people weren't reading Latin if they saw a Bible, Right. but it also changed language right yeah, yeah. change yeah. language yeah it's, it's, yeah it's a phenomenal story yeah well this bible then gets in people's hands and people start seeing these things that luther has been talking about and teaching to his students as a professor and preaching he preached so many sermons he was mm-hmm. always preaching um that again power of the press word of mouth it just spread everywhere yeah. and pretty soon there were large groups of people who were clinging on to this um, God who actually loves us, God who mm-hmm. is, is not this cruel judge over our heads, um, but a God who loves us so much that he sent this person, Jesus, into the world that we might be restored um, in relationship to God, that we might have forgiveness of sins. Uh, again, not because of what we have done, not that we have anything that we can do to earn our own salvation, but because of what God has done in God's love. That, mm-hmm. that God <laughs> so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. Anyway, <laughs> that with a bunch of other people is, is kind of the heart of the Reformation mm-hmm. um, or the Protestant Reformation. And, and it just changed society, it changed language, it changed theology. Um, And and it changed every Christian body at that time. But it also then opened up the doors for other people to be more expressive in their own beliefs. And so then they would have other spin-offs, if you will, that kind of took place from this Reformation, just besides Lutheranism. Now, Lutheranism was not necessarily um, a name that people wanted to have. Certainly wasn't Mm. something Luther wanted. It was kind of an insult, at least as I understand it, from my history at first. You're one of those Lutherans. You follow that heretic Luther. Right. But eventually it came then to be um, a a way of understanding. You would say Luther, and so you would then know there's all this other sets of beliefs that go with that. To the point where 500 years later, we are sitting here at East Side, other side of the tracks, Lutheran Mm -hmm. Church, professing those same concepts of grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, and and then also seeing that we are saved by God and saved in order that we might do good things for other people. Right. So that's kind of a, a history of that. So now I throw up this question, what does it mean to be Lutheran today? And, and what does Lutheranism look like in your context, wherever you might be at, as you're thinking about this conversation? What does it look like here in, in Sioux Falls? And, and I didn't ask this question of you earlier today, Joel, sure. but throwing it out now. Yeah. What did it mean for you to be Lutheran growing up? Well, okay, yeah. Uh, th- thanks for thanks for asking. Um, m- my uh, tradition, it's it, in, in my family, uh, on my one side, um, it's German, and it's lots of um, Lutheran pastors and Lutheran uh, uh, and, and teachers. Um, it, uh, on that side of the family, I think they're all public school teachers and Lutheran pastors. On the other side of the family, they're Lutheran musicians 
and Lutheran school teachers. Okay. And that was kind of also enculturated in, um, for the Slovak side of the family, um, the town in Slovakia where my grandfather came from was an early adopter of this new Reformation because there were German mines. You remember Martin Luther's dad yeah, was a miner. Yeah. So there were there were little German mining villages in what is now Slovakia and they were speaking German language and so they had this direct pipeline to these these published works of this guy Martin Luther, this rogue monk. Yep. And so early on, fifteen hundreds, these Slovak churches are converting into Lutheranism. Sure. And so that's part of my family history. So what does it mean for me to be Lutheran today? It means me connecting to those family systems, those family roots. But it also means um, looking at Lutheranism not so much as uh, an identif- identifying with... I certainly identify with those cultures and with those systems and with my family growing up. But Lutheranism today, uh, if we are to think about the spirit of what Lutheranism is, Lutheranism is versus the um, kind of all those cultural yep. pieces, yep. the spirit of Lutheranism is about some of the things that you mentioned, the um, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, but also this this both and kind of tension of there's the sola statements, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, but then the symbol statements of um both uh, sinner and saint at the same time, simul usus et peccator, uh, which is the Latin phrase that, that Martin, Martin Luther picked up about being sinner and saint at the same time. And so there's this tension okay. uh, that you hold both in balance. Uh, and that, I think, for me, is something that, that I really cling on to in Lutheranism, that we we hold some some things that might be in tension, and we don't necessarily say that we're all this or we're all that, um, that we kind of hold those things yep. both and. Yeah, I, I agree. That's, to me, a, a very appealing part of, of being Lutheran, that already not yet. Um, God's kingdom has come already, but not yet. And, and we're living into that um, with in the world with also the expectation that it might come there that luminous like you're standing in the doorway with one foot in this room and one foot in that room has has been described to how lutherans understand god's work in the world how lutherans understand same time saints same time sinner how how lutherans understand how we are called to to interact with other people to to have a a a theological gospel at the same time as having a social gospel that causes us to to interact and understand ourselves with god but to understand in ourselves um, helping people in the world. Um, yeah. So so that begs the question, maybe phrased another way, what do I need to know about Lutheranism in order to understand how they view the world and, and why they do what they do? Or or if I'm walking into a Lutheran church today, or if I'm walking into Eastside Lutheran, sure. what perspective then do I need to have to be able to really understand what Pastor Joel is saying from the pulpit or what the, the words and the songs and the hymns that we sing are saying about who we are? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that going back to an earlier point that you made, Lane, about being uh, Christocentric, about being centering around the um, the the person of Jesus and the um, Jesus that we understand as this um, universal Christ, who um, you know, there's lots of statements uh, that came up a little bit in our Lenten kind of study yep. about all means all. And that Christ is coming um, once and for all to save this um, this creation, to redeem uh, all that God has made here. And that um, we are then active participants in that for the rest of the world. And yes. it's not just something in our heads, right. but something that then comes through. Yeah in how we live. I, I would say there is an emphasis on education because we were kind of born out of academia at least 500 years ago. Uh, a sense on missions. We have people who are sending not only quilts and things like that around the world, but people who are actively engaged in in sharing the gospel all around the world. The, the Lutheran Church, the ELC in particular, is a very global perspective where it's not just us here in this community, but it's us as God's people in the world. Yeah. And and then that inclusion of, of like Jesus is continually welcoming outsiders in the gospel, that, that we are to look to the, the disenfranchised in the world today and to open the door to them to offer a word of grace. Um, 
and that we are that grounded in grace, that we are forgiven sinners. And, and with that, I think, comes that sense of, of humility. At least that's, I think, for me, what's helpful to, to understand when you go into a Lutheran church. And there's something nice, too, you know, having some uniformity. I can go to a Lutheran church here in South Dakota or down in Texas or in Arizona, California, New York, and I'll be met with that same understanding of God in the world, even if the form looks different or if the music style is different or if they're wearing robes or not wearing robes. Yeah. They're coming from that same place, which is pretty powerful. And, and my guess would be that when we looked at those 10 largest uh, Lutheran uh, denominations around the world, yeah. that those, those experiences would look different, yep. like culturally different. Um, as different as my experience of, of, say, Lutheranism has been in the various places that I've traveled. And yet, at the same time, there would be, though, some of these connecting pieces around um, uh, a Christocentric kind of emphasis yep. and, uh, and, and reading Scripture as part of the worship service. That's something that Luther really um, highlighted. And uh, a, a, a practice of these sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper as sacraments. These are things that really ties together, even though the cultural things would look vastly different, even from what you and I both experience, say, at Lutheran congregations in, um, you know, Chalmette and, and New Orleans right, right. versus Lutheran congregations in the Dakotas. Yeah. Uh, but still there's those connection points, which is really, really interesting. Coming back to, to what we started with, the, the Christian is completely free, Lord of all, subject to none. The Christian is completely dutiful, servant of all, subject to all. And that that's the, the way we interact with the world as Lutherans. Yeah. All right. For those of you who are still here watching, you've been very, very patient as we've kind of gone long tonight yeah. on this. But we promised you something kind of fun. So now we are going to share with you a, a song by the group Lost and Found, who yeah. are, are wonderful friends of, of Pastor Joel's, who he's known for years, who he's toured with and whatnot. Yeah, sure. Well, way back in 2003 at the National Youth Gathering, they shared a song with all of the kids who were gathered about who are the Lutherans in the world. So, granted, it's, you know, what, 18 years old now. Um, <laughs> but it, it's still fascinating because we don't think of Lutherans being out on the world stage and being celebrities and all of that. Sure. Maybe, as you mentioned, because we're so humble. <laughs> you know? Many of them might be Norwegian. Yeah, right. um, but, but there are some interesting Lutheran people in the world who we, we just might not have realized. Now, maybe not all of them are like, practicing Lutheranism all the time, but it's fascinating nonetheless. So um, hopefully you guys have seen this before, and hopefully this will be a, a fun rem reminder if you have, and if not, you're in for a real treat. So here we go from Lost and Found. Big T. 
the pretzel And Dana Carvey is a Lutheran now Isn't that special? Hopefully you enjoyed that um, <laughs> song. It, it's just fun. It's just fun to to think about um, who some of these people are who might yeah. kind of share some of that same religious perspective as us. So thank you to everybody who's been participating this evening. You have been yeah. patient. We've not, not done shout-outs because we've been talking so much about this Lutheranism yeah, right. stuff. Um, but we are so glad that you are a part of this weekly conversation. Honored that, that you take time out tonight more than regularly. Time out of your schedule to have these conversations of faith as we think about who God is calling us to be in our own walk. So we do what we do at the end and we close with Luther's, that would be Martin Luther's evening prayer. I give give thanks to you, my my Heavenly Father, Father, through through Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously protected me today. And I ask that you forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously protect me tonight. For into your hands I commend myself my body, my soul, and all that is mine. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Amen, and good night, and may you be met with grace and freedom and service.